Good morning, Sunset Community Church. My name is Caleb Mayberry. I'm a pastor at Renton Community Church, and it's great to be here with you this morning. Uh, all of us from Renton Community Church are joining uh, you all here together uh, this morning online, virtually, uh, in this weird COVID season. Uh, as I'm sure most of you are aware, uh, we've been talking with uh, Pastor Andrew and the leadership at Sunset Community Church at uh, what it would look like for us to join together. And so we're excited uh, as part of the process to join with you this morning uh, as we celebrate what God is doing uh, through the book of Malachi. I wanted to read a quick scripture from 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 3 uh, that speaks to the heart, I think, of, of what it looks like to partner together. Uh, to fulfill the roles that God has for us, uh, seeing God work in and through us to accomplish the growth that he's doing. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 5 through 9. What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed. As the Lord assigned to each, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. God is building his church through Jesus Christ. And, and by his grace, uh, we get to play our roles. And so I'm super excited to see what that looks like uh, in and through Sunset Community Church and Renton Community Church together. Thank you. God bless you. Good morning, Sunset family and guests. I also want to welcome uh, members of Renton Community Church who are joining in with us today. We are so glad that you are with us today on virtually online. Um, we want to direct our attention to a scripture from Ephesians, it's from chapter 5, verses 19 through 20. And it says this, Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. That command for everything, always, in all circumstances, we are to give thanks, we are to sing from our hearts to the Lord, um, as an offering of thanksgiving to him. And this song uh, just beautifully captures that, the heart of that scripture well by saying, blessed be your name in whatever circumstances I, I find myself in. So let's follow the example of scripture, follow that command and lift up hearts of thanksgiving to our Lord Jesus. be your name in the land that is plentiful where streams of abundance flow blessed be your name blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place though I walk through the wilderness blessed be your name Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glory. Blessed be your name when the sun's shining down on me, when the world's all as it should be. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering. There's pain in the offering. Blessed be your name. Oh, every blessing you pour out, I turn back to praise. When the darkness. 
thanksgiving, offering of praise in whatever season we are in. And we sing this again one more time to you, Lord, in Jesus. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name of the Lord. Blessed be your glory. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glory in its name, amen. Come 
come now found of our blessing oh come now found come now king come now precious prince of peace hear your cry to you we sing come now found of our to grace in O to grace how great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be oh let thy goodness like a feather bind my wandering heart to me I'm prone to wander Lord I feel it prone to
rescue me from my failing who else could offer his only son who else invites me to call him father only a holy God yes Hey, well, good morning and happy 5th of July, everyone. I, I hope you survived the festivities of Independence Day uh, last night and were able to stay safe. Um, this morning, I want to especially welcome Renting Community Church. I know it's already been done, but um, in this crazy time, you are joining us virtually. And so feel free to, to say hi, uh, um, introduce yourself and your family in the, um, in the feed here. We are, are grateful uh, that you're able to, to join us in this time, and hopefully we'll be able to do it in person uh, in the days ahead. Uh, for those of you and others uh, who may be joining us for the first time, we're unpacking the last book of the Old Testament right now, and it is the book of Malachi. And the book of Malachi, we have a subtitle, Return to Me and I will Return to You, which is uh, taken from chapter 3 of Malachi. And Malachi is a prophecy uh, delivered by the person of Malachi, but God is, is um, commanding him to give these specific words. And so we are uh, just three weeks into this uh, book of Malachi. And what we've been finding is that God has specific things that he wants to address with his covenant people, the nation of Israel. And these things are, are important to him um, because it influences his relationship with his people. Uh, the very first week we saw that the impetus for this was love, like God loves his people. And so he speaks correction to those people that he loves. And so in the prophecy of Malachi so far, we've, uh, we've read two of these disputes. The first one, again, was that the people doubted God's love. And so God reminds them that his love is a choice, that he chose them. And that hasn't changed, no matter what their circumstances may make them think. And then the second, last week, we saw that Instead of the priests being faithful in leading the people in right worship, they are despising God by not offering their best to him. They are not leading well. They've given way to corruption and apathy. And so God lets them know that while he is faithful to uphold his covenant promise, they are not being faithful. So one thing we see clearly in scripture is that sin is systemic. Sin is systemic. From the very beginning, we see that, yes, there's individuals that sin, and sin is an individual thing, but when that sin is left unchecked, it spreads. It becomes an acceptable part of culture, and it gets hardwired into the very fabric of society. Sin then becomes part of the system, part of the culture. So we can ask ourselves, well, how do corruption and evil, how does sin itself become acceptable. Well, it's very simply, an individual sins and nobody does 
anything about it. And so that sin becomes acceptable in the culture. And the most efficient way for sin to spread is from the top down, from those in authority and power, those in leadership, to begin to act out evil ways. And we saw this last week in the priests. When leadership makes allowances for sin, then it affects a whole nation. Now, we don't have to look far in our own country to see this type of systemic behavior, this sin, in the Christian church even. For nearly 400 years, a majority of white churches in America figured out how to justify in their own hearts that it was okay to own other human beings. How did that happen? People who could have stopped it didn't. Nobody spoke out or stood against it, and soon it became not just an acceptable, but a normal part of culture. But it didn't have to be that way. At any point, somebody could have stopped and said, this isn't okay. At any point, another leader could have said, no, we're not going to do this, but nobody did for years and years and years. One of my favorite pictures, and you've probably seen it before, is of a man named August Landmesser. August Landmesser. Now, back in 1930s Germany, August married a Jewish woman, which was actually against the law at that time. And as the Nazi party rose to power, he one day found himself as a part of a commissioning of a new Navy vessel. And as a whole mass group of people saluted the Nazi party, he refused. Check out this picture. You've probably seen it before. There in the red circle is August Landmesser. A silent protest. And to this day, his silent protest against the unbelievably wicked yet completely accepted social norms of his day now stands out as an example of being on the right side of history. So let's get back to Malachi. When the leadership, which God has just called out in chapter 1, is corrupt, it should be no surprise that society will be corrupt as well. And in a sense, God is using Malachi as a type of August Landmesser. But this isn't just a silent protest on God's part. It's a very direct dispute. And so this morning, let's look at the third dispute that God has with his people as we see him address an issue that is key to the foundation of the Jewish society. But also it connects to the very foundation of what a covenant is. And so this issue that God addresses involves marriage. I encourage you to open your Bibles to the book of Malachi this morning, chapter 2, verses 10 through 16. It's the very last book of the Old Testament. So if you know the New Testament well, start in Matthew, just go back a couple pages. Matthew chapter 2, verses 10 through 16, and let's read this together. Do we not all have one Father? Did not one God create us? Why do we profane the covenant of our ancestors by being unfaithful to one another? Judah has been unfaithful. A detestable thing has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. Judah has desecrated the sanctuary the Lord loves by marrying women who worship a foreign god. As for the man who does this, whoever he may be, may the Lord remove him from the tents of Jacob, even though he brings an offering to the Lord Almighty. Another thing you do, you flood the Lord's altar with tears. You weep and wail because he no longer looks with favor on your offering or accepts them with pleasure from your hands. You ask, why? It is because the Lord is the witness between you and the wife of your youth. You have been unfaithful to her, though she is your partner, the wife of your marriage covenant. Has not the one God made you? You belong to him in body and spirit. And what does the one God seek? Godly offspring. So be on your guard and do not be unfaithful to the wife of your youth. The man who hates and divorces his wife, says the Lord, the God of Israel, does violence to the one he should protect, says the Lord Almighty. So be on your guard and do not be unfaithful. So here are the two issues that God has right in this passage with his people. Walking down from 
hey, you've doubted my love. And hey, priests, you're not leading well. And now, hey, people, all people, you're divorcing your wives. You're marrying unbelievers. Now, before we unpack this a little bit in the original context, um, I want to have uh, just a little bit of, of real talk today. Because we're going to talk about this in the original context, but also we're going to talk about how it applies to us. And I know a number of folks in our church have been divorced. I don't know the details of all your stories, but I know that no matter the circumstances, nobody ever wants to get a divorce. Nobody, at least no sane person, commits to marriage with the thought that at some point they'll get divorced. So I think we can start with the basic premise that we all agree divorce is bad. And no matter what your specific circumstances were surrounding a divorce, I want you to remember this morning that there's a difference between conviction and condemnation. Conviction happens when we are confronted with the truth and it pierces us in such a way that we see it as truth. And then we let it push us towards something better. So conviction, it, it should bring hope. Now condemnation, it can be based on truth as well, but it's presented without hope. It's just shame and guilt which not only make us hopeless, but push us towards despair and depression and ultimately towards death. So secondly, the other thing that address, is addressed here other than divorce is this idea of marrying someone that doesn't have the same faith as you. Now, this is also a reality for some people in our church, but I want you to know the same thing. I want you to hear it from me. There's no condemnation here. So then let's ask the question, why is God bringing up these two issues? First, we see in verse 13 that the people of God know that something is wrong. There's this sense that God's favor isn't on them, that he is distant, that he's not responding to their worship. And you know what? They are right. They may be clueless, but they at least know something's wrong. And look at this again in verse 13 and 14 we just read. God says, another thing you do, you flood the Lord's altar with tears. You weep and wail because he no longer looks with favor on your offering or accepts them with pleasure from your hands. You ask why? It is because the Lord is the witness between you and the wife of your youth. You have been unfaithful to her, though she is your partner, the wife of your marriage covenant. So God's not leaving them hanging here. He says, you know what? If you're feeling this, yeah, you're right. I'm not pleased with you because on one hand, you're worshiping me. On the next one, you're mocking me by being unfaithful to your wife. And as a reminder, he lets them know that when they made that powerful commitment of marriage to each other, that he, God himself, was a witness to that. We'll see later in the text that the issue of marriage is not the only sin in society. God will address others, but he starts with this particular issue. Because like he did with the priests, it has a deep connection to the relationship between him and his people. It has implications for all of society. So one of the things that's important for us to know is that marriage, the institution itself, was God's idea from literally the beginning of time. As soon as God created man and woman, he had marriage in Mine. Listen to this from Genesis chapter 2. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his mother and father and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. So there's this image of, in Genesis of God creating man and creating woman, these complementary beings. And God essentially walks Eve down the aisle in the garden for the first marriage. This coming together is a beautiful and powerful and purposeful thing. It's been in design, God's design since the beginning. So marriage isn't cultural. It's not trivial. It's not an excuse to party. It is deeply spiritual. And when a man and a woman covenant together in marriage, God is a witness to that covenant. Here's another important thing to know about marriage. The marriage covenant is one of the closest things we have that mirrors the relationship that Jesus has with us, his church. In the New Testament, we see the illustration of marriage repeatedly used as an image of the type of commitment that Christ has to the church. 
We see Jesus is loving. Jesus is faithful. His love for us is sacrificial. He will never leave us or reject us. These are things that are in place in marriages, but they're also a demonstration of the type of love that Jesus has for us. So in this way, marriage is rooted in the past good design of God, the present commitment of God to his church, us, and ultimately our future hope. This marriage, God's commitment to us will never be broken. So marriage is a covenant, it's a promise, and it's a blessing. So then the question, so why does divorce and marrying unbelievers in particular displease God and go against his covenant? As we read, God has some pretty strong words here. First, for those who would marry outside of the faith. Look back at verse 11 again. He says, Judah has been unfaithful. A detestable thing has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. Judah has desecrated the sanctuary the Lord loves by marrying women who worship a foreign god. Now first, it's important to know that this idea of not marrying somebody that is of a different faith ties back into the covenant God made with Israel years earlier. This isn't based on ethnicity but it's based on idolatry. A key part of God's covenant laws given to Israel are designed to give them, or to keep them, rather, holy or set apart from the pagan cultures that surround them. And so when the people of Israel marry outside of the faith, they're committing a type of spiritual adultery. In essence, as they are marrying women who worship pagan gods, they're trying also to wed their faith with idols. Instead of being wholly committed to God, they are instead embracing a a duality of belief and allegiance, which is destructive both to them, their future children, and ultimately the society of Israel. We have a Buddhist uh, worship place right up on the hill here. It would be like if one of you went and and worshipped the false idols of Buddhism and then came down at 1030 and worshipped with us. Those things are incompatible. So you, remember, you may remember wise uh, King Solomon who built the first temple to God. In all of his prosperity and wisdom, Solomon had one stronghold of sin in his life that proved to be his undoing and ultimately the undoing of the entire nation. First Kings chapter 11 says that Solomon had many foreign wives who eventually turned his heart toward false gods. Despite seeing God himself and being blessed by God and hearing the warning that God himself gave to Solomon, Solomon didn't listen. And eventually, everything he built, everything he accomplished would be destroyed. And this is what happens when we live dual lives. It is a shaky foundation that will not stand. And this is being brought up to the people of Israel who now get to worship in Solomon's rebuilt temple. They remember that the temple was at once destroyed. Now it's been rebuilt, but it was destroyed because of his unfaithfulness. And I can't imagine that the lights weren't coming on for them as they heard this. Oh, wait a second. Is this history repeating itself? I've done a lot of premarital counseling with couples, and it's a beautiful thing to see two people come together with complementary gifts and personalities. I mean, my wife Jessica and I, if you know us, we are very different personalities. I'm an extrovert, she's an introvert. I could eat meat for every meal, she prefers vegetables. Uh, I'm a huge sports fan, she's tried. Uh, We're very different, but the longer we've been married, our differences are so complementary that it has been a blessing to me, to her, to our kids, the things that we bring to the table and our strengths have, been, have allowed both of us to flourish as individuals. And they've certainly allowed our children to flourish as well. So the idea of being complementary in marriage is a beautiful thing. We see that from the very beginning. Man is different than woman. That's why that marriage is a complementary thing and it's beautiful. But when someone marries someone of a different faith or no faith at all, that's not complementary. It's at best a difficult challenge. It's one thing to have a different taste in food 
or root for a different sports team. But when you have a completely different world view, it's a very difficult thing. So I'm going to speak as plainly as Scripture does to this issue. If you are a Christian committed to walk in the ways of Jesus, marry someone who, help, who has the same desire. When a marriage is rooted in a foundation of faith in Jesus, it is built on a foundation that is more solid than anything else. The Spirit of God is a powerful, unifying force in a marriage. My wife and I, one time when we, uh, Jude was just a, a little guy, maybe three years old, we were having a disagreement. And it was one of those classic marriage disagreements where she was saying one thing and I was saying another thing. We might as well have been speaking a different language. And as the tension was rising in our voices and as we were getting more and more upset at each other, neither of us understanding each other, my little son Jude walked into the hallway and he could tell something was going on. And he looked at us and he says, Mama, Papa, I think you should pray. In that moment, my wife and I looked at each other and we looked at her son and we knelt down there in the hallway with him and we prayed. And in that moment, the spirit of God was that unifying force. The conflict de-escalated. All of a sudden, we could understand each other and the spirit of God was certainly working in our marriage and even using our son so it is an important thing, and that's why God speaks to it. Now, I want to also say I know some wonderful people who are married to someone that doesn't share their faith. So let me encourage you with this. If you're married to someone who is not a, a follower of Jesus, I want you to love your spouse like Jesus loves you. Romans 5.8 says, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't even wait for us to say yes. He didn't wait for us to get our act together. Jesus died for us before we even acknowledged him. Love your spouse like Jesus loves you. And I appreciate the words of 1 Peter 3 in this context as well. He says this. He says, wives, in the same way, submit yourselves to your own husbands so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives when they see the purity and reverence of your lives. So again, this is not a, a new thing. Scripture speaks to this. And in that same chapter, there's instruction to the husband as well. In the same way, you husbands must give honor to your wives. Treat your wife with understanding as you live together. So I want to encourage you, love your unbelieving spouse well. Hold fast to your faith and stay in community with other believers. On the issue of divorce, we already talked about how the foundation of the marriage covenant is rooted in Israel's covenant with God. As we read, when two believers come together in marriage, God is a witness to that marriage. So it's not a trivial cultural practice, but a deeply spiritual one. And it reflects back to the nature of God himself. Unfortunately, so much of our marriage approach is cultural. It's based on, hey, let's throw the biggest party. Or it's based on, what is this person going to give to me? Or how are they going to complete me? Some years ago at a previous church, I had a man uh, start to attend our church in the back with, with his fiance, And they, they uh, didn't engage much with the church, but they were showing up regularly. And about a month or so in, he came up to me and he says, hey, we're looking for a pastor to do our marriage. Would you consider officiating it? So I said, well, let's meet. I want to hear your story. And as he began to share his story, he shared that in the past he, he had, um, had been married and had divorced his wife and he had a daughter from that marriage. And I said, can you tell me about that? Like, how, how did you get to that point of, of divorcing your wife? And he said, you know, I just, I just didn't really feel it anymore. I just didn't love her. Just the feelings had kind of faded away. And in that moment, I realized he didn't know what marriage was. He didn't know about the covenant. He didn't know about the choice. He didn't know about that love is not just an emotion. And so I asked him in front of his fiancée, I said, so will you do the same thing when your feelings fade for her? Sadly, a huge percentage of our culture approaches marriage without the idea of it being a covenant, a commitment. 
We say in sickness or in health, but do we really mean that? And because of that, a huge percentage of us know the brokenness that comes from divorce. Many of you have walked through that yourselves, either in your own marriage or your parents got divorced, and I can certainly relate to that as well as mine did. And Scripture does acknowledge that there are valid reasons for divorce in the case of unfaithfulness or abandonment. And that can be an issue. But the issue in, he, in this context is that God's people are simply being unfaithful. They're, they're rejecting the covenant of marriage for no reason at all. And the issue connected to that is that unfaithfulness is also an unfaithfulness to God himself. As God started by pointing out with the priests, he's now pointing out for all people how marital unfaithfulness connects to the people's relationship with God. There's also a really very real, very tangible social injustice here as well. Listen again to the words in verse 16. The man who hates and divorces his wife says, the Lord, the God of Israel, does violence to the one he should protect, says the Lord Almighty. So be on your guard and do not be unfaithful. Does violence? He hates her? Now, in the ancient context, a divorced wife was now vulnerable to all sorts of inequities and abuses. A divorced wife was now one of the most vulnerable people in society. And while we may live in different times, the fallout from divorce is just as bad today. Divorce breaks the heart. It destroys relationships. It shatters families. And it massively affects the lives of children's futures. And many of you know this because you've experienced it. So I want to encourage you today, fight for your marriages. Or as we just read what God's word says, be on your guard and do not be unfaithful. I want to end with this. God's grace on our life is much bigger than we realize. While divorce under most circumstances is sin, it is not unforgivable. Our hope rests in God's faithfulness, which always outdoes our unfaithfulness. Israel was an unfaithful wife who regularly strayed from her covenant commitments. She deserved to be divorced and abandoned. Yet, as we see in the prophecy of Malachi, God pursued his wandering bride. And his love brought her back to himself. Jesus himself is the great bridegroom who pursued his people at great personal cost. As followers of Jesus today, we have to be reminded that Jesus himself was full of grace and truth. He wasn't just 50-50, but he was full of both. So we need to know this, grace and truth. Grace is not permission to live contrary to God's ways, but an invitation to live in them, despite anything you've done previously. And truth, it's not a sledgehammer, but it's a scalpel. God's truth exposes what is not good and true, and it shows us a better way. My hope for all of us as Christians is that we would seek the truth of God in every single part of our lives, And that our anchor would be his unfailing grace. We will fall. We will make mistakes. But when we fall, may may not be backward toward the death of condemnation. But forward into his loving conviction. Let me pray for us to that end this morning. Father, we know your your word is convicting. And truth is, it's, it's corrective and it's necessary and it's important for us, Lord. And I pray that as, as we get to know your word more and as we align ourselves with your good and perfect ways, that we would see them for what they are. The enemy would try and tell us, oh, that's not true today or that's not as important as, as, as maybe a pastor would make it think or, or uh, the, the Bible makes it sound. Father, I pray we wouldn't buy into that lie, Lord that we would see the systemic nature of sin and we would choose to make choices that are in line with your good and perfect ways. And Lord, it would start with us. It would start with the very foundation of our society, which is the family, 
that it would start with our marriages, Lord God, the spouses we would choose. And Lord, in our present day, that we would love our spouse like you love us. Oh, Father, may your grace and your truth be fully present in our lives. May we not be afraid of it. May we not take it for granted, Lord. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
so good being with you, church family. Hey, everybody, both uh, Sunset Community Church, Written Community Church, and friends that were uh, gathering with us this morning. Um, I am really excited about next week. July 12th, we are going to be regathering for the first time since March 8th. Now, some churches are using the term reopening, but the church was never closed. We've just been dispersed for a bit. And so next Sunday, we have a chance to come back together. Now, I understand some of you are in a vulnerable category, or you just don't feel like now is the time, and we totally understand that. So there's going to be three options for you next Sunday. One is to gather with us right out on the grass by our community garden. Bring your own lawn chair, bring a blanket. We're going to sing together. We're going to exposit God's word. We're just going to see each other, and we're going to be smiling. Our masks are going to be on, but we'll be smiling with our eyes. So that's option number one. Option number two is if you want to come and participate, but you're not sure about being around a group, we're going to have drive-up spots available for you. They'll be designated. You can simply drive up, stay in your car, and smile and wave from there. And thirdly, if you just don't even want to, to, to go out at all, we understand that. Um, there will continue to be an online worship gathering for you as well. So you can continue to tune in on Facebook or on YouTube. But we're excited about uh, the potential to start to regather again. And if you have any questions, please reach out to us. And we hope to see as many of you as we can in person next Sunday. God bless.